Good evening, everyone. I am Amanda Mata from South Africa. I run a digital media agency. I have a couple of questions, Please. but I'll stick to three key ones. Um, to start off with, Stefan, your stats, are they not a representative of the cultural understanding of knowledge within the German community? Um, I ask this in the context of South Africa, where we've noted that content that is usually negative is what spears the purchasing of newspapers in our, in our country. And it's what's driven a lot of our purchasing power in the print space as well as digital. So just to understand, is, it, is there no right. um, reference to that? Then, in the context of digital and social media, and I play in the social media space, how, from your expert advice, do we make provision and in the inclusion of citizen journalism um, where we're looking at a lot of the fake news that are coming through that are actually citizen-based journalists. I say journalists in, in adverted commas, mm -hmm. not really journalists, but people that are normal. We know from the statistics that are released through the Facebooks and the Twitters that a mother will trust the advice of another mother, a product supported by another mother. Right. How then are we not then breaking that barrier down? And then lastly, in the discussion about legalizations and regulations, uh, I have a few issues about that, but it's debatable. At what point do we bring in the startups um, into that conversation, particularly about how we regulate the meters that are brought out? Mm -hmm. It seems to me it's like a barrier of entry for startups when we already have legal IT um, matters. Great questions. Thank you. This gentleman, please identify yourself. <coughs> Laurent Cohen Tanuji. Right. Uh, I, uh, I guess I'm afraid it's more. Uh, a reaction than a question, but I can put it in a question form. I mean, I'm coming back on the legal discussion we, or presentation we had, I, I don't see why, I mean, when we talk about fake news that really have an impact on, on politics and democracy and potentially on the election, when you think that Donald Trump was elected with just 75,000 votes in three states, you can assume right. that maybe the Russian interference had some impact at this uh, such a small margin. So if you compare with <clears throat> the financial markets where, where and the dissemination of false information is very severely <clears throat> sanctioned criminally, uh, I don't see why intentional fake news in the sense of manipulation right. should not be also criminally sanctioned. Right. Then the question is, where, where do you hit? And there, you know, I, I recognize the difficulties, but if you take, make an analogy with, with corruption, the fight against corruption, the OECD Convention Against Corruption decided to hit where it's um, maybe the easiest, maybe it's not fair, it's hard to target corrupt foreign officials, but you can hit companies that corrupt them is faster and so or more easily. Right. And so I would, with this analogy, I think the social networks are easier to target. They've got <coughs> plenty of money they can either do more effort in monitoring the content, and if not, they should be heavily sanctioned. Thank you. And well, last point, okay. I think the US is in better position to do this, and maybe that's what's happening now in Congress. But if not, other countries can do some of it. The European Court of Justice had the right to be forgotten, and that had a sort of a global impact. So I think things can be done. Merci. Thank you. Um, this lady here, and then, and then a mayor, please. My, my question is, first and of all... Can you identify yourself, uh, do you mind? Sorry. Yes, Carrie Halfordy Hardy. I'm a... My question is, uh, based on what you're saying here, who should be the arbiter? Because we're talking about citizen-based journalism, as, as uh, the lady over here talked about. But then you have the question, for example, that was brought up at a recent conference with Baltic uh, ambassadors, mm -hmm. where there was deliberate... Uh, misinformation being planted by state organisms. So it's not merely a question of what's coming out on social media, but it's also what's coming out in state-sponsored organisms. And that, to me, is something where you can't simply say that the arbiter should be a state-appointed regulator. And so if you could speak to that, I'd be great. great. Thank you. That's a very good question, having looked a lot at RT, for instance. I'm Mel Shitrit from Israel. A few years ago, I talked in this conference about the cyber and I would like to know what you think about the cyber in this, uh, in this subject that we're speaking about because the cyber became to be much more stronger than ever before and it is developing very, very strongly. 
And of course, it has a very big influence about the possibility of creating a fake news because by cyber you can get immediately into almost every, uh, every site of every, of every campaign and everything and see everything in it. That's what happened in the United States, for example. I would like to hear your relation about these uh, cyber attacks. Thank you. Thank there are a couple, at least one or two hands way in the back. Or maybe it Thank was. I, I had a friend helping me That's amplify what I the thought. reach. Okay. <laughs> uh, my question is for you, Susan. Uh, sorry, just identify yourself. Sorry. My name is Natalie Cartwright. I am one of the people who runs a startup. I have a uh, AI startup that works directly with banks. And the reason why I'm at this conference is we're relatively early stage. We're about Series A, but because of our channel partners with banks, my product will be in the hands of tens of millions of people over the next couple of years. Um, I'm really interested in having an ethical first approach, but it's not that easy to know where to start or how to do that. So I'd love your advice on, on how someone in my position is able to do that, what your, what your approach would be. And you also mentioned that you're interested in having that conversation. Would love to be a part of it if it does happen. Thank you. Great. Um, yes, is that like, Cooper, I think. Hard to see. Richard Cooper. Harvard, uh, one of the speakers, maybe two, mentioned anonymity. Could we do something about that? The highways, as Erlanger calls them, don't admit anyone on them without a name. Now, of course, one can give fake names, but you could make that illegal and therefore chargeable. So can we elim eliminate anonymity? in these social media. Thank you. Um, if there's one more, fine. And, and then we'll go back to the panel. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, thank you very much. Dania Khatib, I want to ask, we have been speaking here about fake news, about who's responsible for that, how to correct them. My question is very simple. Is it feasible, given the big amount of data that's on social media every day? And now the radicalization is mostly done over the internet, over social media. Is it feasible? Who can do that? Who can do such a big job? Thank you. Yes, I, I think in the end you've asked the hardest question. Um, I think what I'll do, given we've got a little time left, is just go back to the panel and have you respond to whatever has been addressed to you, but um, what makes sense to you, and in the usual way, we'll go in, in reverse order. So, Stefan. Okay. Um, that was a very good question, and of course, um, culture plays a big role, and I even think it's, it's human nature Culture is important, also human nature. Um, we are drawn to things that steer us up emotionally. And actually, fake news that work, if you look at them, but all the fake news that have been really successful, they are very emotional. They, they touch you. I mean, this is, why, um, 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 this is why in Germany, for example, a lot of that is on, on immigrant crime, but then crime against um, vulnerable people, against children, against women, you know, because that's, that steers you up emotionally. And, um, and also the social networks have been, they have been optimized to feed into that attention economy that we have. And, 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 and um, people click on that and therefore it also shows up in your news feed more and it feeds, feeds more into it. Mm -hmm. And so that's something we will have to talk about how we deal with that and how we, how we reverse a process where basically technology takes advantage of some um, issues with our, um, with, with, with our um, nature um, of being drawn into these emotional issues. And the people are saying that we need to th talk about, for example, how um, algorithms um, select your news feed and that, for example, um, the, user, the user of Facebook should get control what kind of news they want to have featured. Do I want to see more my family, you know, what's happening in the family? Or do I want to see more um, diverse uh, kind of news? Uh, the ability to, to really have your own say um, in terms of how you want to, um, how, what kind of news you want to be fed on social media rather than the algorithm just picking up on your natural tendencies. We will have to have these kinds of conversations. Um, I wanted to make one brief comment on, on the regulatory issue because Germany has just um, gone down this road this year and, um, and uh, adopted uh, a law forcing 
Facebook, uh, Twitter, social media companies to take down illegal speech within 24 hours. And, we, and, and the focus here you have to understand is illegal speech. So libel, if you, if you tell lies about a person, something hate, like that. Hate it, speech. Hate speech. Yeah, yeah that, that needs to be, be taken down. That's illegal speech in Germany. And, and if they don't take, uh, if those social media companies don't take it down within 24 hours, they can be heavily fined. The problem with fake news is, or with the fake news that I've been seeing, are political fake news. They wouldn't fall under this kind of law. There's fake news. Most fake news in Germany is not illegal and not illegal in most democracies, especially if it's about political stories. We want people to be able to express themselves freely. So I'm very skeptical about regulatory approaches because it starts already with the problem of how you de define mm -hmm. fake news that would be illegal. And taking it down has huge implications mm -hmm. Um, for freedom of speech um, uh, censorship. No, that's great. Thanks. And uh, I, will, I will end yeah, it here. That's good. No, I mean, part of the problem is speed. I mean, 24 hours seems not very short, <laughs> frankly, to take down hate speech and so on. And just to, yeah. to, the, to the last um, yeah, yeah. To, the, to the last question. The only way you can do this is with AI. Yeah. Right. This technology, there's no, I mean, there's millions of posts going up. You will need smart technology to right. do this because there's no way that human beings can review all of this. Which is a kind of part of our circular problem. Antina. <laughs> 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 To add to what Stefan has just said, I think we should not be decide to define legally what find, uh, fake news is so diverse that it's very difficult to define from the legal point of view. It looks something very complicated. So uh, on the contrary, I must that we use what we have and uh, contextualize things. Uh, the context is uh, uh, we have certain notions for trouble, for example, or problems uh, to the uh, public order. Order, so we have enough laws to uh, answer these uh, questions. But to regulate everything, we have a woman senator in France who made the uh, draft law to, for, for a law, draft law on uh, fake news. And I think it's a danger, there's danger there, because in that case, we'll have to define exactly what fake news is. Uh, but as we have just seen, there's a great diversity of fake news. So to answer the different questions that we raised, I think uh, we could, uh, this idea of co-regulation, because we historically the right for digital activities, this is a soft law, it's not a binding law. It is essentially of private origin. And now we are in a trend where we have to co-regulate between uh, public and private actors. We have to have uh, sanctions that can be just uh, uh, responsibility, uh, from responsibility to uh, penalties that are issued by the European Court of Human Rights. We have uh, law cases also, which now deal with these cases and really bring uh, solutions. And uh, they interpret the uh, existing uh, rules and regulations uh, within the context of uh, false news on the uh, media. Yeah, from my perspective, I think with the uh, big amount of fake news, there is no 100% uh, solution out there. So I think even if the governments or regulation try to find, um, uh, put a 24 hours uh, limit on that, that, there is no 100% coverage because the amount of data, the tools, maybe through the artificial intelligence tools, I think there is a way to close that gap, but I, I think it will be not there. So the current way how we do um, uh, issuing information, I think, uh, needs a radical change. And I think the gentleman from Harvard is the right one. I think uh, in the future you will see that we, everybody will have a digital identity to do anything kind of business out there. And then we can identify if somebody really uh, be trusted going forward. Which is a nice idea, except in Britain you don't have a national ID card. In America you don't have one. You have data shoots. You have all kinds of But there issues. are certain nations, are really Estonia, other yeah, countries yeah. are now um, ramping up that. So that's something that no, 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 everybody's right. working on. No, 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 it's true. And then, you know, someone once said to me, you know, if you asked an American if they'd be willing to have a chip put in their head so the government could follow them around and um, actually listen to them all the time, they, of course, would say no. But of course, we all do it voluntarily. Sure, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Susan. So on the general question about just the complexity of the challenge, 
I think technology has to be a part, regulation has to be a part, education has to be a part. Um, and then we haven't really talked a lot about politics, but just maintaining the kind of liberal democratic fora in which debate can happen, back to the rabbi's point. Um, and I, I'm not talking about religion, but I'm just talking about the kind of vigorous debate that helps defend truth. Um, so it's going to be a multifaceted solution. It's not going to be any one. But the point is, again, this allocation of responsibility across different stakeholders. Uh, I also think it's a question of picking our battles. We aren't going to be able to get rid of all fake news or indeed all uh, negative consequences of different technologies. The question is, what really matters? Um, and then finally, on this question, there are ways, um, and to the gentleman's point, there are ways to introduce regulation that is manageable. For example, advertising. There's no reason, in my view, why these companies should be able to have one standard for advertising online um, and a far stricter standard for advertising you know, in the paper version of the New York Times. Um, with respect to Richard's comment on anonymity, it's an important point, and we know from other sites like Yik Yak, which was an anonymous social media site that has been taken down, uh, that the FBI got involved in from time to time. We know that worse things happen on anonymous sites. The problem is that the perpetrators on anonymous sites are very hard to find, and the resources required to do so are um, disproportionate in many cases. Um, and the harm is already done. And indeed, that's a big problem with this point I made earlier about the law lagging behind technology, which is by the time the law gets around to doing anything, uh, it's too late and the harm is done. Um, and then finally, the question on AI. Um, I'd be happy to take it offline in more detail. Um, you should have a look at, an, at a network that's forming with companies like Salesforce and Microsoft. But the fundamental question for startups is from the very beginning to ask, what, what is the real good we're doing with this technology? And where might there be risk? And where there's risk, what might, might we do to mitigate that risk? And, um, and in your case, look at others. Look at DeepMind. Look at the other companies that are out there and see um, what their thinking is and how their thinking on these issues um, might be relevant to yours. But I'm happy to take it offline. Great. Um, and then to conclude, I just wanted to make one comment since we're talking about fake news, and my president keeps attacking my newspaper and others for fake news. Um, the one thing you have to understand about President Trump is he actually adores the New York Times. He has a very intimate love-hate relationship with the New York Times. He grew up with the New York Times. He is from New York. He grew up in Queens. The New York Times to him was Manhattan. It, it was the elite. It was glamour. He actually wants our love as much as he dislikes us. Um, and of course, when he calls us fake news, clearly what he's trying to do, he's using us as, as uh, puppets in his play that he's creating. But he's simply trying to make sure that when we actually do real news, which we tend to do, that particularly touches him and his administration, he can undermine its credibility by calling it all fake. Now, how you control the President of the United States is beyond me. But I do want to ask you to join me in thanking the panel for what is a great discussion, and of which was on time also.